uh, County, State of California suffering from housing crisis, which has adverse effects on the county of Mendocino. The county is suffering from a shortage of, ho of housing for its citizens of moderate, low, very low, and extremely low incomes. This is due in part to a substantial and continuing rise in the costs associated with land permitting labor and materials. In light of what's happened here in the last three months, I think that ch uh, sentence needs to be changed because the continuing rise hasn't been happening here if you've been watching the newspapers in the last three months. Another question I have, if you go over to page 9 and 13, it's in down to B. Basically, there's no, it's all up to, it says, if the exclusionary housing plan is determined to be incomplete by the Planning and Building Service Department, it shall be returned to the developer within 30 days along with a list of deficiencies required information. No application to which this chapter applies shall be considered complete until an inclusionary housing plan meeting the requirements of this section has been submitted to the Planning and Building Service Department. I, I don't see any appeal process there. Basically, if you don't agree with your plan, doesn't agree with a staff person in our Building and Planning Department, that's the end of the road. Shouldn't there be an appeal process in here to the Board of Supervisors or something? Uh, because the way it states here, it's, it's basically the discretion of the a staff person at building and planning. If they don't like it, they can throw it out and there's no appeal to the Board of Supervisors. Um, my understanding is that virtually anything, um, staff decision is appealable and it would be, you know, I mean, first of all, you go through the department and you'd appeal to the department director, but then ultimately it could come to the board if there were di a disagreement. So I, I wouldn't recommend that we do a whole separate appeal process for this, um, but we can certainly look into what the standard appeal process is in planning and building, and if it isn't written out in a form that people can identify, we should probably make sure that happens. Yeah, but this is not a policy, this is an ordinance, right. so I think it needs to be stated in there that there is an appeal process. You don't have to state, okay. but it's just appeal to the Board of Supervisors. I mean, because it's not, this is not a policy document, this is an ordinance. Okay. County Council, please. We can look at that. You're not taking action on this ordinance yeah. today, right. so we can look at that for um, next next um, board meeting. Yeah. I, I, I concur in, in uh, look towards that as an improvement to be a more uh, conducive sure. ordinance so other questions from board members supervisor thank you mr chair um <coughs> mr. Chair, in the in the um, staff report the background discussion page the first page you reference um, you reference the stakeholders, you don't define them, but you talk about differences of opinion and then you say that uh, standard practice in inclusionary housing ordinances has been applied. How do, you, how do you define that? How did you determine what standard practice is? We've done, re <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we've done research looking at, um, I want to say, maybe 20 different inclusionary ordinances around the county or around the um, state, and those include some city ordinances, some county ordinances, um, and we've looked at, you know, what what is familiar in most of them for different um, different sections, and that's how, if it was mostly that kind of language was used in that uh, section, then we considered it to be standard. But didn't you find a wide variety of, of ordinances and a... There are a very wide variety of ordinances, but there's also certain sections that have standard language in them. And you can find it's very similar in most, uh, most ordinances. And you, you've referenced several times in your discussion housing providers. How, do you, how, do you, how did you determine who those were and how did you define housing provider? We um, originally called them the development community, and we have a list of people who wanted to be in that group, um, a, an email group, and then they did not like being called developers. They wanted to be called housing providers, and so we changed the title. So this was an informal process that you used to develop the stakeholders, I'm assuming? Yes. So, so they were self-selected individuals that wanted to participate, or did you select them? 
Uh, we sent invitations to many, many uh, real estate groups, to the business council, to uh, known, known developers who have interacted with our building and planning department, um, all the nonprofits that build. Um, it was quite a wide group. How the self-selection came is who showed up at the meetings. Okay. Um, I don't have the documents that, that, that we reviewed, but we, we looked at this issue intensively and there was quite a bit of staff time spent I don't know maybe a year and a half or two years ago mm -hmm. and this document looks very different than the one we were talking about at that time there might be some similarities but there were definitely there's some significant differences one of the questions I have is how you came up with um, the level of applicability when you talk about you begin it at 10 units I don't understand why it wouldn't uh, be put into place for um, five units or more, isn't that our cutoff for major and minor subdivisions, isn't it, five units? It is, and that discussion was held in both groups, and um, we had um, some of the housing advocates that were a advocating for as low as one. They wanted an, on every unit um, because that would theoretically provide more uh, affordable units. Uh, the development community didn't like that at all. They really wanted it to be quite high um, if it had to be. And so it was sort of a, a negotiation back and forth between those groups about acceptable language. And um, you want to.